Okay, so uh, I've seen that uh, we reach around uh, 60, but it's going up uh, very fast, the number of participants. In order to keep uh, the time, uh, I'm going to start uh, immediately. First of all, a good afternoon to everybody or good morning for who is uh, on the other side of the ocean. And uh, uh, welcome to everybody. As you can see here, I'm uh, on the stage. Um, I don't know if uh, at all are able to see also the other two speakers because I can see them in my window, but I don't know at all if uh, they see the same. Uh, who are Gert uh, Van uh, Duinkerken, sorry for the pronunciation, and Greg Thomas from the US. So in our uh, webinar of today, we are going to address some topics. And uh, in order to introduce it, uh, I prepare a few uh, slides in order to give also an overview about the Nutrition Commission, because uh, uh, this webinar which is the manager, he is under the umbrella of the uh, European Association of uh, Animal Production. At the same time, has been organized and uh, the speaker has been selected by the Nutrition Commission, of which I'm uh, the president uh, by now, but uh, for instance, one of the speakers has been the former president a few years ago. So let me start with a, a brief presentation about uh, um, uh, about uh, the uh, commission and other uh, small thing before to start. So here we are. Um, I hope you are able to see uh, the presentation. Maybe if you will take a few seconds. Is visible? Yes. Okay. So uh, this is uh, one of the webinar which has been organized, as I said, by the European Federation of Animal Science. Uh, usually, this kind of webinar are done at the second um, Tuesday of the, the month, but we move a little bit uh, at the end of the month due to the fact that we were just back from Davos, which uh, was hosted our uh, annual meeting a uh, few uh, weeks ago. Well, uh, just to introduce a little bit myself and also the other member of the Animal Nutrition Commission, uh, here at the list, uh, I'm the president, there is a, um, the vice president, Sam Campanier, uh, Rosalind, uh, Latifa, Maria Jose, and uh, Javier, Daniele, and Suzanne. All are members very active of this commission. Um, actually, we uh, recruited back again Gert also um, this year, and all are extremely active in defining several activities which are under the umbrella of, of EAP and uh, um, uh, its commission. Um, well, what we did in Davos was to uh, organize six sections uh, which are listed here we collect 133 abstract, and what we address in that case were mm, the impact of nutrition on sustainability, environment, methane emission, gut human health, and so on. But at the same time, we invite uh, um, some keynote speaker, for instance, from industry, for, uh, from FIFA, and we are going to plan a webinar in uh, the spring with Stefano, because it is important for us to keep uh, and reinforce the connection between academia, research institute, and also uh, the industry. Well, uh, what we are going to do or what we are going to offer for the next uh, meeting in uh, Porto next year in, uh, in uh, 2022, uh, well, uh, here the list of the sections that we are going to propose. Uh, we hope that you will find one uh, which is suitable for uh, your activities in terms of research. So we decide to address new alternative innovative revised feed in farm animal and farm fish, because it is important to keep in mind that also we are hosted by a, co a, a country in which also aqua feed is extremely important, as in many parts of Southern Union, and not only because 
just to think to Norway for other uh, for salmon and so on. And then sustainability, uh, nutrition and environment, uh, and other type of um, of sections. Uh, we we are, we are going to organize also some uh, section in conjunction with other commission like uh, recent advance in host nutrition, the tentative title because we are we have to define the final title for, for this with the host uh, commission and also other with nutritional regulation of fertility, product quality and nutrigenomics with uh, physiology and finally another one with PLF or cow commission on smart cow. So uh, I hope that we can take note a little bit about this, uh, at least as a key uh, words in order to uh, be informed about we are going, what we are going to put on uh, the floor for this new next uh, conference that we will get next year in Porto. But uh, in the same time, few weeks ago, uh, few weeks after that meeting, we, we are going to organize also another meeting, energy and protein metabolism and nutrition, is, a, uh, is a, another kind of meeting, also the audience sometimes is different, is organizing conjunction with uh, um, some colleagues in the US, but also from Australia, South America, and so on. And of course, we hope also in this, in this case to get a good participation and it will be in Granada, so very nice uh, city in the south of Spain. And uh, I hope we uh, will get also a lot of uh, contribution all from all scientists around the globe. Well, let him, we move directly to the contents of uh, the webinar of today. Um, the first uh, topic will be referred to ruminants and aquatic resources. The second one will be by myself on pigs and uh, former food in animal nutrition. And finally, we will got a presentation from um, um, Greg Thomas from the US about sustainability. But uh, uh, let me introduce the first speaker of today, which is Gerd van Duinkerken uh, from Wageningen University. He's a he is in charge of the business unit manager of Wageningen Livestock Research. Until 2019, he was head of the Department of Animal Nutrition. He also uh, contributed in founding the Center for Animal Nutrition in the Netherlands, and he was a former president of this commission a few years ago. He's involved in several uh, projects uh, in Netherlands and not only about uh, sustainable animal nutrition and sustainable livestock system. So I invite uh, Gert to give his talk about aquatic research in ruminal nutrition. Okay, thank you, Luciano. And I will start sharing my screen. Can you confirm that it's visible? Yes. Okay, thank you. Then I will continue. Yes, and thank you for the uh, invitation to be involved in this uh, webinar and to share this presentation about aquatic resources in ruminant diets. And actually, um, I also presented this work at the meeting in Davo. For, so for those of you who already uh, joined that presentation in, in Davo, uh, maybe this uh, is not very new information, but I hope that uh, a lot of you were not able to uh, attend in that specific session and so uh, that you will find some new information in this. Um, the topic is being put in the perspective of uh, mitigation of enteric methane emissions, so uh, in the perspective of climate change and greenhouse gas emissions. And I've prepared this talk together with my colleagues Jan Dijkstra and Wouter Mausela. Uh, there's mainly three topics on the uh, on the agenda in this talk. First, some general information about climate and methane emission. Then second, uh, second more focus on mitigation scenarios for enteric methane, and that could be uh, feeding strategies and, and also a focus on aquatic resources uh, as part of, uh, of that feeding strategies. And I will conclude with some take home messages. 
But let's start with uh, the general topic of, of climate, climate change and methane emission. Um, you probably have all seen or read or read partially the IPCC report, which was published this summer. It's about climate change uh, and where we stand as, uh, as society and as the world. And in this report, there is information included about the change in global surface temperature. And if you look at the graph in this uh, sheet, you can see that especially in the last 70 years that we've seen uh, quite a significant uh, effect of human activity uh, resulting in an additional change of global surface temperature. And of course, livestock production is part of this human activity. If we look at the relevance of uh, different types of greenhouse gas emissions coming from livestock production systems, then you can see in this pie chart that enteric methane is the largest part of the pie. So almost 40% of the global emissions from livestock supply chains originate from enteric methane emission. And that's probably also the reason why in research there's so much attention be dedicated to finding solutions to mitigate enteric methane. In general, you could say that there are several strategies or uh, uh, well, types of measures you can take to reduce the emission of enteric methane. And I think that one of the most important ones to mention is an overall improvement of farm and herd management conditions. Uh, so you can think about increasing the longevity of the animals or reducing the replacement rate or try to improve the overall animal health. So uh, solutions in this area, so technical solutions, herd and feed management, all contribute to a more favorable ratio between methane and milk production. And uh, maybe a lot of these solutions do not directly have an effect on methane, but they mainly have an effect on this ratio, CH4 per kilogram of milk. Another interesting track is uh, the, uh, uh, well, the area of solutions of breeding, breeding strategies. And in a recent study in the Netherlands, in, in Wageningen, it was reported that the heritability for the methane concentration in the exhaled air of uh, dairy cows in Dutch dairy cows is about 23%. So this is a clear indication that breeding offers quite good opportunities to reduce enteric methane. But of course, it will take you some years. It's uh, mainly a solution which will help in the more midterm and long run. With dietary strategies, you can have a more immediate effect because you well, can actually say that you can start changing the diet of the animals uh, already tomorrow. And if we take a closer look at the dietary effects, uh, uh, it's basically about trying to have an effect on the rumen fermentation process. And uh, you can summarize that there are three causal factors which have an effect on uh, the quantitative uh, size of the, of the methane emission. So you can think about trying to change the chemical composition of the diet in a more favorable direction. And I will go into that a little bit more in depth later on. And also try to influence the, degre the degradation characteristics of the, of the diet, of the feed components. The second part of the solution could be to try to influence the microbial growth, the microbial efficiency, and the type of substrate being used by the microbes as a, a an effect on the amount of methane uh, which is being uh, formed in the rumen. The third part is uh, trying to influence the type of volatile fatty acids which is being formed during the rumen fermentation process. And if we take a closer look at these volatile fatty acids, then you can say in general that if we have a fermentation pattern which leads to the formation of a lot of uh, acetate and butyrate, that will lead to a general increase of the hydrogen uh, sink in the hydrogen uh, surplus in the in the rumen. And if we have a fermentation pattern with, which leads to more propionate, that will lead to a reduction of the surplus of hydrogen in the, in the rumen. And uh, in general, you can say that uh, a surplus of hydrogen in the rumen is the basis for the formation of enteric methane because the methanogenic bacteria in the rumen will uh, convert hydrogen together with carbon dioxide into methane and water molecules. 
something more about the chemical diet composition. Um, you can say that uh, if the diet has a high concentration of protein and char starch, then in general, that will lead to uh, less methane formation than diets with a higher uh, concentration of degradable fibers and of sugars. And this has been illustrated with uh, data of Bonning and Dijkstra from the Netherlands. And then, of course, it's interesting to uh, have a closer look at the topic of this presentation, the aquatic resources. And could aquatic resources also help to mitigate enteric methane production? Um, I think if we talk about this topic, then it's uh, helpful to make a distinction between the use of aquatic resources as a feed material or uh, the use as a feed additive. So if we take a closer look at the feed materials first, then you could say that if you use uh, biomass as a feed material, then you are talking about a situation where the feed material delivers energy and nutrients to the animal. And if you would like to use a new feed material, then of course you have to uh, comply with uh, regulations, at least in the European Union. And there are regulations in place for putting new feed materials on the market. And there's also a feed material register available in the European Union, which describes which materials you can use in animal diets. Um, and if we are talking about uh, aquatic resources as a feed material, then it's not only about the chemical composition of the feed, but we as well have to take into account uh, the potential effects it can have on the feed intake, the rumen fermentation pattern, et cetera, and also the, the performance. And of course, uh, then it's uh, very uh, well interesting to also compare the aquatic resources with the terrestrial feeds. So can they compete with each other? How about the costs of the different uh, feed materials? How about the availability, uh, the volumes? Are there uh, large volumes available? Are these stable uh, volumes? Um, uh, how about safety and health aspects? And also the ecological sustainability of the feed material. If we go to the other category, the use of aquatic resources as a feed additive, then we are talking about a situation where we are targeting at a specific biofunctionality. And if we use feed additives, also there regulation is in place in the European Union. Uh, and uh, an assessment has to be performed, uh, an assessment by the European Food Safety Authority, which will have a closer look at the efficacy, uh, the safety of the product, uh, the additive for the animal, for humans, for the consumers, for the producers, and for the environment in general. On top of that, you can say that also the general food law of the European Union is uh, very relevant because uh, this uh, well sets the criteria for all the producers who put uh, uh, a material in the food chain uh, that they have the res responsibility to bear uh, for food safety uh, and quality of the food product, and in this case, the feed product. Um, and it's interesting to take a look at aquatic resources because about 70% of our globe is covered with water. So you could say that that offers a lot of opportunities to produce uh, or to harvest aquatic biomass. And that could be an additional source next to availability of terrestrial biomass products. And that opens up opportunities to reduce the use of land for the production of feed and food. However, um, if you take a look across the different studies available, and then I think that there are no clear indications yet that aquatic resources can compete with terrestrial feed materials for a high inclusion in the diet of ruminants. So if we are trying to use aquatic resources for large scale supply of energy and nutrients, I think that still uh, the terrestrial feed materials uh, have a better uh, position than the aquatic resources. So I think that it's fair to say that the business case for the use of aquatic resources in ruminant diets currently depends on specific biofunctionalities and the mitigation of enteric methane could be a very relevant one. Um, if we look at the current state of feed additives which are being used or, or which are uh, able to reduce enteric methane, then you can say that many additives have been tested in vitro but if you take a closer look at the results in an in vivo situation, 
that we see that many of these additives don't show persistent effects in an in vivo trial. Uh, it is also true that the effectiveness has been well established for a number of feed additives. So for example, nitrate and sulfate, but also free NOP, uh, their effect on methane has been well established also in in vivo trials. Um, and then let's make a step to aquatic resources. In this presentation, we have made a distinction in three categories of aquatic resources. That are uh, the seaweeds, which contain uh, bromoform, the seaweeds, which do not contain bromoform, and the third category is the category of the microalgae. And you probably have all seen uh, items on social media or in magazine, which indicate that seaweed seems to be very promising as a feed additive or an ingredient to mitigate enteric methane. Um, but when we're talking about seaweed, it's also uh, good to uh, keep in mind that seaweed is not one specific feed material. In fact, there are more than 10,000 different species of seaweed around, brown ones, green ones, red ones, and they do differ from terrestrial plants. For example, they don't uh, have lignin uh, um, in their chemical composition, but they do have some various other types of carbohydrates uh, and carbohydrate structures available. Um, one or maybe two species uh, have a demonstrated uh, potential, high potential to reduce methane uh, emission. And that is the species Asperohopsis. So Asperohopsis taxiformis and also Asperohopsis armata um, are seaweed species, red species, uh, which have an active compound, bromoform, which has a decreasing effect on methane emission in, in ruminants. But of course, it's also interesting to take a look at the rest, the non-bromoform seaweeds, and to take a closer look uh, at bromoform as such and the impact of that uh, compound. So bromoform can have uh, an effect on enteric methane, and that's not a new effect because already in the in the 60s of the last century it was reported that bromoform has the capacity to inhibit the enzyme activity which is needed for methane production and as a result there's also this effect of this asperopsis uh, seaweed species and if we look at in vitro studies which have been performed with this asperopsis uh, seaweed then results are being reported ranging from 80% up to almost 100% of methane reduction. And it's also uh, demonstrated in quite recent studies. However, uh, there's luckily there's also in vivo results available. And this is an overview of five uh, quite recent uh, studies of the last four years where uh, Asperogopsis species have been used in in vivo trials in different types of ruminants. And you can see that in all five of these studies that the use of Asperogopsis uh, showed a consistent effect on methane reduction. So the methane reducing effect was demonstrated in all of these five studies. Um, depending on the study, also other effects, side effects were reported. Uh, some studies reported uh, a decrease in uh, trimeter intake. Some also reported some problems with palatability. But it was also found out that in a study with beef steers, for example, that there were no differences, no effects on average daily gain, on daily gain, on carcass quality, and on consumer taste preferences. And in another study, it was found that there were no residues of bromoform found in, for example, the meat, the kidney, uh, the fat, uh, or the pizzas of the animals. We also performed a study with Asperogopsis taxiformis in Wageningen in the Netherlands, uh, in the Netherlands quite recently. And in this study, we looked at the potential transfer of bromoform from the seaweed, so from the diet through the animal to different types of, uh, of tissue, uh, of organs, and also to milk, uh, to manure, and to the urine. And in this study, we worked with three doses of uh, Asperogopsis, so three doses of seaweed. We had a basal uh, level of 67 grams dry matter per day, per animal per day, a double dose of 133 grams, and a five-fold high dose of 333 uh, grams of dry matter per day. 
and we took samples of these different uh, organs, different tissues, and also of the excreta of the animal. And we found in this transfer study that there were no, uh, there were no uh, detectable levels of bromoform found in the different organs and also not in the fat tissue, but we did find uh, bromoform present uh, at some uh, points in time in the milk and in the urine, but not in feces. So you can say that bromoform can be transferred to milk and bromoform can be transferred to the urine of the animal. We also sacrificed two animals in this study uh, where we took a closer look at the rumen wall. So these were, uh, this, this rumen wall uh, was inspected. And we did that for two animals for which we were sure that they always consumed their seaweed, although it was at the lowest dose we used in this experiment. And in, uh, during this rumen wall inspection, we found some abnormalities, uh, for example, uh, uh, abnormalities which relate to the inflammation of papilla. And although the study was not designed to specifically have an in-depth look at uh, consequences for rumen wall, uh, it is, well, important, I think, that we noted this, and it uh, is in line with early, earlier indications in a study with sheep, where also uh, indications of rumen wall damage were reported. Um, then let's make the step to the non-bromoform seaweeds. Why could they have an effect on enteric methane? Well, that can be because of uh, quite different reasons, I think. Uh, seaweeds can contain large ranges of different bioactive compounds, and that can be a uh, uh, macronutrient like proteins, but it can also be more specific uh, compounds which are present in some types of, uh, of seaweed. Uh, it has been demonstrated in vitro that multiple species of seaweed have uh, uh, an effect on uh, methane. Uh, however, in an in vivo situation, we do not yet know uh, trials which have demonstrated a significant effect uh, of such non-bromated uh, seaweeds on methane emission. We also performed a quite recent study uh, in the Netherlands ourselves with three different types of non-bromoform uh, seaweeds, and these are seaweeds which can be grown or harvested in the northwestern uh, part of, uh, of Europe. And we performed a trial with 64 animals. One was a control group of 16 animals, and then we had three different groups, which all were provided with uh, 150 gram per animal per day of a dried seaweed. Uh, in the second group, we used a red seaweed. In the third group, we used a brown seaweed. And in the fourth group, we used a mixture of two brown seaweeds. And we selected these seaweeds because we uh, upfront first did a literature survey to find out which uh, seaweeds had potentially uh, maybe an effect on, uh, on methane. And next we did an uh, in vitro study to have a closer look at uh, uh, about 12 or 13 types of seaweed, which could also have an effect on, uh, on methane. And we selected the, the most promising ones from this in vitro study. However, in this trial, we did not find any effect on enteric methane. We did measure it with green feed stations, so it was a, a, a continuous uh, measurement of the, of the methane emission, but we did not find an effect of the seaweeds on enteric methane. We also did not find an effect on feed intake. We did, however, find uh, an effect on uh, the milk yield in one group we found that there was uh, a little bit more than one kilogram of milk per day extra for this specific group. Then the final category is the category of the microalgae. Uh, maybe they can also have an effect on enteric methane, and that could be because of their high protein content, which I already showed uh, can have a favorable effect on a quite low uh, methane emission. It could also have to do with the presence of polyunsaturated fatty acids because they can, uh, they can function as a hydrogen sink as well. And it could also maybe have to do with specific carbohydrate, carbohydrate structures available in these uh, microalgae. However, there's only a few studies available on the effect of microalgae, and these are uh, in vitro studies and not in vivo studies. 
But if we take a closer look at the available in vitro studies, then we see two examples uh, of studies that performed last year in 2020. And in both studies, there were no uh, clear conclusions about a mitigating effect of microalgae on methane reduction. And there also has been a study uh, this year where um, uh, it was a bit harder to draw clear conclusions because of some interactions that occurred between the microalgae species and the type of substrate being used in this, uh, in this study. So I think that uh, if you take a look across the different studies that it's fair to say that there are no convincing data yet that show that a low dose of microalgae has a significant inhibiting effect on enteric methane emission. So finally, uh, some take home messages. Um, aquatic resources are an interesting opportunity as an alternative for terrestrial biomass. And that uh, can be because uh, it, it can be attractive because we don't need any additional land. It can also be for specific biofunctionalities related to this type of, uh, of seaweeds or of aquatic resources. However, there are no indications yet, not from studies, that aquatic resources can already compete with terrestrial feed materials for a substantial inclusion in a ruminant diet. So not for a large scale supply of energy and uh, nutrients. So the business case for aquatic resources and ruminant diets depends on specific functionalities. For microalgae, uh, unfortunately, there are no indications yet that low doses of these algae will have a significant effect on methane. And also for the non-bromoform seaweeds, we see that there are no clear indications yet that they could have this uh, favorable effect. For bromoform seaweeds, uh, it's another story because the enteric methane inhibiting effect has been quite well established. Although it's also fair to say that the use of this type of seaweeds is not free of risks and that more work should be done on assessing uh, one, the animal health impact, second, uh, the feed and food safety aspects, and third, I think also important to take a closer look at the environmental and the climate impact of large scale cultivation or harvesting uh, and processing of this type of, uh, of seaweeds. So uh, with that, I come to the end of this presentation. And of course, I'm open uh, for any uh, questions there might be. And I will stop sharing my screen so that I can also have a look at the, at the chat box. So thank you very much, uh, Gerd, for your excellent presentation. I'm not able to see uh, any question for the moment. But in the meantime, waiting for a coming question, maybe. May I ask you, uh, in your experiment that you have shown, which was the transfer efficiency of uh, bromoform from uh, feed to milk uh, that, and urine, eventually, that you were able to estimate it? Uh, yes, we do have the, the, the data available both on the intake of, of bromoform because we know uh, the amount of seaweed which has been ingested and also the concentration of bromoform in the seaweed. And we also have the data on the concentrations which were found in, uh, in the milk and also the volume of milk. Um, I have not done any calculations on the transfer efficiency, but uh, the paper is already online. So it's easy for everybody to, uh, to have a closer look uh, in, in the paper. It's, uh, it can be found online. It has been published. Yeah, upcoming. So uh, maybe you can give uh, I don't remember if the people at home is able to see the questions. I don't think so. So if you want, uh, Gerd can give a, a brief. Uh, yeah, I can see the question. Of it. Yeah, the question is uh, about uh, Southeast Asia, uh, where seaweed also has been used uh, or is being used as a food source. And does application of seaweed will disrupt the food chain? Um, well, you can inter interpret the question in, in many ways, I think. Um, 
I don't see a direct competition uh, of the use uh, as seaweed between feed and food application, because I think that uh, for feed application, we have now a specific interest in some very specific types of uh, seaweed. That's because of their uh, enteric methane production capacity. And that's not the type of seaweed which we are using now in the in the food chain. So it's different product, different type of biomass with also uh, different specifications. So I don't see any examples of uh, direct uh, competition. And well, moreover, it's also fair to say, I think that if you can use a specific seaweed for direct human consumption, then why would you use it as a feed material? Because uh, the ability and the uh, favorable capacities of ruminants relate to their capacity to convert uh, low-grade biomass, which we cannot digest ourselves, and convert that for us into uh, high-quality human food. So I don't see uh, also a very clear competition element uh, in that respect. Uh, the second one is about the uh, readability uh, of methane production in sheep. If you have any indication compared to cow, uh, we did not perform uh, any uh, studies on sheep ourselves. Uh, most of the, the, the studies with sheep have been performed in New Zealand and uh, Australia, also quite uh, quite recent uh, ones. And I did also mention on, on one slide uh, the studies which have been performed with uh, with sheep. And of course, um, uh, there's quite a lot of commonality in the biology and also the uh, the digestive uh, uh, tract of of the sheep and the, and the Cow, so I think it's fair to say that uh, there's quite good comparisons to be made between the two animal species. Okay, and do you have any information, another question, about the effect of seaweeds on cow reproduction efficiency? Um, well, if you use uh, seaweed uh, in a low dose, uh, mm -hmm. then it does not partly contributes to the energy supply and also the protein supply or nutrient supply of the animal. So in that respect, you cannot expect a lot in terms of uh, effect on zootechnical performance. Uh, so it can only have a significant effect if there is a specific biofunctionality, and that could be both positive or negative. So uh, if uh, a specific compound in seaweed could act as an anti-nutritional factor, that could, for example, have a negative effect on the degradability or digestibility of, uh, of let's say, proteins or other nutrients, but it could also have a favorable effect. Uh, and it was a surprise to us that in our study with the non bromoform seaweeds that we found an effect on, uh, on milk yield in one of the uh, treatment groups, uh, more than one kilogram per animal per day. But it was a surprise to us, and we still have not a very good uh, explanation why this favorable effect would be there. So it yeah. of course could be a, a coincidence, but it was a significant effect. Side effect. Yeah. yeah. And uh, um, the question is how to measure the methane emission. I think is uh, it was reported in the presentation, but probably was missing. How do you I think measure the methane emission with a clean field for what I understood? I don't see the question in the chat box, but it's about uh, how you can measure uh, methane emission. Methane emission, yeah. I think that in general, you can say that uh, using a, a climate respiration chamber is yeah. the, the golden standard for uh, methane mm -hmm. measurements. But uh, a disadvantage is that you can on only use limited numbers of animals. And also a disadvantage is that you don't have uh, a practical situation uh, because animals are there in uh, uh, well, in a quite different situation, differing from uh, a common barn. So the green feed is a very uh, helpful uh, addition or alternative, I think, for that. So uh, especially in the last two and three years, we use quite a lot of green feed stations in different types of study, not to fully replace the, the climate chambers, but it's a quite nice addition. Uh, you can work with larger number of, uh, of animals, so learn more about a uh, higher number of animals and also work in more practical conditions. Yeah, furthermore, let me add that actually <laughs> the green feed has a, also some, is also useful in terms of um, ethical aspect and the welfare of the animal and so on compared to the regular yeah. 
Yeah. But of course, it's not Very a continuous. Uh, it's not a continuous measurement of the yeah. exhaled air, so it's only spot sampling at yeah, uh, specific yeah. moments uh, at at the day. And uh, if you have uh, a sufficient number of uh, measurements, then it's still uh, a fair uh, fair indication for the overall uh, methane emission. And uh, there is another question: uh, It is possible to process seaweed in a sustainable way? Before being used as feed ingredient ad or additive. Yeah, so that's about the harvesting and the processing uh, before mm. you can use it. I think um, the the way that seaweeds are currently being used in animal nutrition is, in most cases or almost always, uh, in the form of dried uh, seaweeds, yeah. um, and of course that will consume energy. Yeah, and it could also have an effect on the on the quality of the seaweed, and especially with the bromoform containing seaweeds, you also have to do with um, uh, a functional compound, which uh, can evaporate. Evaporate, so uh, it, it's a volatile component. Uh, so uh, uh, if so you, you, if you give it heat treatment, you can lose uh, yeah, and also part or the all of the active uh, part of the, active, <laughs> active compound. Of the so seaweed. that's something yeah. to keep in mind if you treat it. So uh, freeze drying then could be a better alternative uh, for uh, for heat treatment, for example. And uh, get I have a, another curiosity. Are you going to plan something specific in order to investigate the uh, the room and wall damage that you observe in this case as side effect? And you said we don't know what happened actually. But are you going to plan a specific study on that? And uh, uh, with uh, the all the, because I didn't, it is not clear. I don't remember if you observed this effect with all the dose, dose that you tested or just for the highest one. Uh, yeah, we tested uh, two animals uh, and ah. in both we found this, uh, uh, this effect uh, or effect at least this, uh, these observations. Uh, it would be very helpful uh, if, if more groups around the world uh, could yeah. work on this uh, bromoform containing seaweeds to learn more about uh, safety aspects for both the animal and also for, uh, for food safety. We ourselves uh, uh, hope to be able to uh, do some follow-up research where we would like to learn more about uh, um, well the fate of bromoform. Uh, so we know what goes into the cow. But uh, what the next steps? Uh, how uh, is bromoform being handled in the in the metabolism of the animal? Uh, in what forms uh, will it uh, be stored or uh, be excreted by the animal? So we would like to learn more about that. So that could also uh, help us to learn more about uh, well the health effect for the animal and also the uh, food safety aspect. And I think it's important to do. But I hope that also other groups will have the opportunity to uh, do more work with uh, with seaweed. So the last, two, the last two questions, really the last because we are a little bit over time, uh, are about uh, how or did you measure the iodine content and the effect of iodine in seaweeds? And the other is referred to removal of uh, salt uh, and how much does it cost? I don't have any data about uh, the cost of removing the, the salt from the from the seaweed. And also in this study, we did not have a focus specifically on uh, iodine. So, uh, okay. uh, I'm so sorry. Thank you very much. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for your excellent presentation. I think that you provide a very nice overview about uh, these uh, marine material which are available for ruminant and diet or uh, will be available. We will see uh, if they will be successful or not. Uh, Thank you. My greetings to Andre Benik, uh, if you have the opportunity, because I know I was in Lelystad for uh, one year, so I know very well. So thank you again, uh, sorry for this uh, personal bracket. <laughs> and uh, let we move to the next presentation that is mine, actually. Uh, so. I'm going to share my presentation that will be um, on, uh, uh, we move to uh, other mono, to monogastics and uh, specifically uh, I'm going to, uh, I don't know if, uh, are you able to see my presentation? Yes. Perfect. So, um, uh, 
what I'm going to tell you is something about former food products as alternative as alternative feed ingredients, uh, mainly for pigs, because we work a lot uh, during the last few years on uh, on pigs. But uh, as you will see at the end of my presentation, there there are opportunities also for other species. Well, why uh, we start? While we start to work on uh, um, former food, well, for several reasons, some has been mentioned already before, but one of uh, the main concern from the public, uh, general public is, well, we are feeding one third of the cereal that uh, we collect around the globe to farm animals. Uh, and this uh, can be good, can be bad, it depends. And of course, there is a lot of pressure also from uh, the general public about uh, solution in order to improve sustainability of livestock farming and so on. And in this direction, it is essential for us as uh, animal nutritionists, researchers and so on, look for uh, alternative or innovative feed ingredients and uh, link it to this also what is happening during the last few weeks. Uh, uh, you can see here in All About Feed it has been reported that the wheat price is uh, going up very fast. And so the competition between feed, food, fuel, and fiber is uh, a, a big issue on the table. Well, at the same time, why we consider former food? Because actually they are um, an example is extremely effective uh, how a circular economy can be implemented also in, for livestock systems. And uh, so uh, former food represent a way by which we can uh, uh, connect or build up a network between food and feed uh, production system and uh, connect they in a positive way, let me say. Well, uh, what are former food? Uh, former food are food produced for humans. Uh, so uh, they have been produced uh, in a right way. They are of good quality in full compliance with the food law. Uh, this means that actually we can eat them, but unfortunately due to packaging defect or uh, portioning defect or other small stupid thing, these materials are not able to reach the human uh, food market and therefore are available for other purposes. We are talking about a biomass which is not waste. This must be clear, especially in, under the umbrella of uh, uh, feed and food law in the European Union. Well, here some example. This picture comes from uh, some plants that I visit around uh, Europe mainly. And you can see we can have several kinds of material, pasta, bread, um, uh, bread of cereals, or other type of material like candies or caramel and so on. So we have a different kind of material which are available for for uh, this purpose as biomass that can be converted as animal feed. But of course, there are some restrictions. So not all the former food or all type of material coming from the food chain can uh, be converted as feed because we got the BSC story. Therefore, we have some limitations. For instance, we cannot use animal proteins or um, animal byproducts in former food um, because, as, um, because it's forbidden. It, it is not allowed to use scattering reflux and also house waste as a feed material. By contrast, we can get in this form of food some uh, dairy products, eggs, only, and non ruminal gelatin. This latter is extremely important, especially for candies, for instance, because for producing candies, we can use uh, uh, ruminant or pig gelatin, and according to the type, uh, the, the can resulting candies can get or come back to the feed chain or not. So what must be clear, we are not talking about waste. This is extremely important. But how much former food are available? Actually, uh, in Europe right now, uh, we are able to process about 3.5 3 million tons of X food. And 
actually the potential is for two times this quantity. It means that looking at just around Europe, we are able to uh, look for other biomass which can be used for producing feed and for feeding our animals. But of course, in order to put up this material in the diet of our animals, we have to look very deeply at this material and um, evaluate them as feed, because they have been produced and are on the market or around the market as food, but we have to feed them eventually to the animals. So we have to look inside this material and explore very well their potential and their feature, also from a dietetic point of view. In this respect, we conduct several studies here in Milan, uh, collecting also around Europe, asking to perform a full process to send their representative samples. And what we observed was that uh, usually this material, for instance, here uh, we have a comparison with barley and wheat, former food products are usually characterized by the highest energy content compared to common cereal, winter cereals. The content of starch is about more than 50%. It depends what we use in order to prepare this material, of course. But for sure, another feature that we observe is that the fat content is usually higher, up to six times higher than common cereal. And this explains this value here about energy. What we have seen here in Europe has been confirmed also recently by a, a very huge study conducted in the US uh, by staying group and uh, co-workers in which they have seen the same uh, over there. And for instance, you can see here, uh, former food or bakery meal is the common name used in the US. As you can see here, contain in this case about 45% of starch and in our the slide before, we were around 50-55. It depends what we use in order to produce this uh, material. Of course, composition is important, but we uh, address a little bit also some dietetic aspects. And in this respect, what we investigate here in Milan was also, for instance, the glycemic index uh, potential of this material. Also, when we consider them as the ingredient, but also when we include them in the diet. Because the original idea was, okay, we can uh, use this material in, uh, for formulating specific diet, for instance, for young animals, and in this respect to help them, for instance, in increasing feed intake and so on. And what we observe is reported here, when we compare these materials this material with corn or um, wheat uh, heat processed, this uh, heat processed wheat, we observe that some of these materials are characterized by very high glycemic index potential. It's, it is also clear here in this picture. Therefore, what we did was to select one of the best candidates here as ingredient for a, a pig diet. And when we add this material in a diet, we were able to obtain also a diet with a high glycemic index potential for feeding the pigs. Therefore, what we established was, is that these materials are nutritious, rich of starch, and most of the time also fat, and also some uh, pattern in terms of digestion can be uh, maintained also in the diet when the inclusion is uh, uh, quite enough. Let me say, in this case, 30%. But of course, we heard a lot also in the previous presentation about safety. Um, so uh, in this respect, we address a little bit also this aspect in two ways. First of all, about the microbiological quality. I skip this slide because actually what I can say, we are talking about a material which is thinly processed, and therefore it was from a microbiological point of view extremely clean. But one of the big issues referred to this material are the packaging remnants. And uh, as you can see here, some uh, newspaper also uh, address this topic uh, also in the UK and so on. And we know that also the European Union is paying attention about the disaster because we have to feed our animals in the best way, in a safe way. 
Accordingly, we address this topic, investigate our material. And what I can say and is that these materials are extremely clean, usually. Well, as you can see here in this figure, we have, they are clean, but we have plants which are able to work very well and others which are able in less, less well, let me say. And this is due to the fact that the management or the processing in each plant can be different. But for sure, we have to keep in mind that we are talking about packaging, which has been allowed and authorized also for food. So we have some margin in terms of risk for uh, health of the animal, of the humans, and so on. But another aspect is what we can find usually as contaminants in this material, even low, we can find mainly paper. And it depends on uh, the plant, also some microplastic, as you can see here in the blue bar. So there is a lot of work that is needed in this direction. And in the near future, we are working in different directions in order to implement also the methods and help the European Commission in defining the cutoffs for this material. And we will see what will happen in the near future. But for sure, what it, we can say nowadays is that these materials are safe, in my opinion. But of course, we are still working uh, before uh, the farm or before the animal, let me say. So what we did was to perform a few studies in piglets in order to investigate the effect of this material on the growing, uh, the stability, and so on. I'm going to show you the last one of our study because the previous one has been already published. And what I can say, any detrimental effect has been observed substituting 30% of common cereals with former food. In a second, in a third study, in the last study, the third one that we did, actually we did something different. We differentiate the type of former food. We select two types of former food, one salty and so based on the, on the snacks and the other on the, uh, sweet material. Okay, and this two diet has been compared with uh, a common cereal diet for post winning figure. Uh, this is the scheme that we adopt in our experimental farm. And uh, so we test three different diets a combo one, a salty, and a sweet one. Uh, well, in this study, we didn't change the diet. Uh, during the winning period, I have to be honest, in order to reduce variability and so on. So we didn't adopt the two diet as always happened. We were interested to verify also the effect on metabolome and so on. Uh, and what we observed that in terms of performance, we didn't observe any uh, effect. So if we use a colorful diet or a salty or a sweet diet, we go. Uh, we obtain the same performance from the animal. The average daily gain, the body weight, and so on were completely equal. Uh, also, we investigate the microbiota because we uh, got some information from our previous study that this can be modified by this diet. We have to consider that the salt and also the simple sugar in this material is different. And therefore, some effect on the microbiota can be expected. But in this uh, study, as you can see, this uh, is submitted, uh, we didn't observe any effect. This study was uh, uh, considered also the VFA content in the gut. And again, as you can see here, in terms of VFA producing the gut, we didn't observe any difference between the, the three groups. Well, uh, as I said, this study has been done on piglets. So not for sure, not the best model for evaluate also the uh, meat quality, for instance. But uh, due to the fact that we were authorized to sacrifice a few animals for uh, gut, intest uh, gut health investigation and so on, we collect also some fat from this animal. And what we have seen that actually uh, compared to the feed, in uh, the animal, uh, some differences, especially about pupa, has been observed. So using even the, the diet where is uh, the same quantity of energy, the same protein and whatever, we did our best in order to make this diet comparable. 
what we have seen in terms of adipose tissue, it uh, was something different, especially for PUFA, but uh, whereas for the other, the balance was, or the difference were limited. Of course, we are talking about the piglets, uh, so um, we have to repeat, and we are going to repeat this study for a complete uh, production period of, uh, uh, of pigs and uh, in a different scenario in order to investigate if what we observe in this uh, small animal can be replicated also on larger and in terms also of meat quality, fat and so on, we will see. So to summarize, we can say that we are uh, able to use this material as serial substitute up to 30% without any detrimental effect on uh, growth performance of piglets. But of course, we have to go ahead and investigate the same uh, diet and the same substitution with a larger number of animals for a longer period. This is like the key issue, the time needed to reach the uh, harvesting uh, weight. And of course, address a little bit in detail also the product quality. Well, what we did here in Italy has been done also by our colleagues in Illinois. Professor Stein hosted our PhD and uh, they worked and performed some, uh, some studies uh, similar to us. In this case, they substitute corn with bakery meal and again also them observed that uh, is a, this material work very well up to 30% on gray matter, uh, which is uh, about 50% of the total corn in the diet without any detrimental effects. But when you add too much of this material, we got some differences in terms of every day gain and uh, feed conversion rate, which need to be addressed further. So uh, from the, uh, our side and also from the west side, we can say up to date that up to 30 percent, this material can be used without any detrimental effect. But this is quite common to other byproducts that we learned during the feed history, let me say. Not only for feed, because uh, in literature also the commercial one, uh, there is a lot of debate about the use of this material also, for instance, for poultry. Of course, the omnivorous animals are um, the best candidate for use of this material in their diet, but we got already some data uh, from a uh, diary. This is a very nice study conducted by uh, the University of Vienna, where they did uh, or placed some uh, cereal and energy sources with a bakery meal in a meat lactating dairy cow. Why I underline meat lactate in dairy cow? Because of course they got a very nice result. And also in terms of uh, risk of star and whatever, they didn't observe so much. So indicating that this material is suitable also for ruminant. I fully agree. Even if we have to consider that these animals were with lactate in dairy cow. So uh, above, uh, I don't remember, 149 days, maybe something like that. Uh, so uh, we have indication that this material has potential also in the dominant, but in this case, maybe we have to, um, to look a little bit more in detail also other phases of lactation in order to see if also in combination with other forages, what happened. Well, but I didn't mention nothing about sustainability until now. Uh, the reason is we have a great speaker after me, after the coffee break, so uh, it's an honor for me to host our uh, colleague, um, Greg uh, Thomas from the US, who will talk about LCA and sustainability. But what we did here in Milan with uh, the help of uh, a group from the engineer faculty was to estimate with the water saving if we substitute uh, common cereal, saving that for human diet, with former food, former food in pig's diet from 30, gram, 30 kilogram until 110 or 120 kilograms, so the slaughter age. What they estimate, so it's not uh, my calculation because uh, uh, they are expert in this field, they estimate that we are able to save also some water. And this is essential because we talk about LCA and whatever, 
methane, but also water is a big, big, big issue for everybody and all our around the globe are discussing and addressing this topic. So we cannot forget about this. And we have to take a, a, and consider also these aspects in the near future or immediately also tomorrow. Well, let me conclude with this uh, bullet point that we say in which you can see for what we have seen here in Milan and also in the literature, former food has some potential. They are uh, nutritious material, rich of, uh, for what we have seen on average, rich in starch and fat mainly. They are characterized by high uh, safety standards, so this is good. And uh, for what we have seen, not only here in Milan, but also in coming uh, progress uh, work around the globe, when the inclusion is uh, up to 30%, they work very well. We don't know if playing with other ingredients, we can go further, we will see. We need, of course, to investigate, address some other aspect. And about sustainability, we have some indication because we start usually from something which is dry. This is extremely useful in terms of uh, energy or power input in any system, but I'm not an expert. I need some help in this direction and we will see. So that's all for today. And let me conclude again before the coffee break and before the question again, keep in mind that we have the next meeting uh, next year in Port. Uh, in port. Let me see if uh, I have the questions. I have to manage myself, as you can understand. I'm not able to, to see new questions in the chat. Ah, okay. Uh, I have question in the chat, but not in the question uh, and so on. So uh, let me uh, start with... Uh, So the first question is about the uh, composition. Are stable, are quite uh, const is constant the composition? Well, for what uh, we have seen, um, the former food processor are able uh, to follow uh, some recipe. Therefore, according to the portfolio of suppliers, they are able to guarantee a quite good stability in terms of composition. For instance, I got the opportunity to visit a plant in Switzerland uh, where they have a very well consolidated uh, recipe. And uh, uh, because they had a supplier over the year, they know very well what is coming every day or whatever. And therefore they build up a, a balanced uh, um, recipe, which is quite stable over the year. But of course, they are also able to produce some uh, specialities uh, for, especially for the young animal or for specific foods, which are maybe requested by uh, feeding uh, compound feed producer and so on. This is what I learned visiting few, more than few, uh, plants around Europe. Uh, another question uh, is the moving. Uh, is about, uh, do you think that contaminated food waste can be source of African swine fever? Well, in Europe, it is impossible to use catering reflux or house uh, waste as feed ingredient. Therefore, what has been established, at least in Europe, is to um, separate 
waste from food leftover, food losses or whatever. So it is impossible nowadays in Europe to use material which can bring back for what we know like from a law, based on the law, which is in force in Europe, to use material which can bring back in the food chain contaminants or like in the uh, swine fever, uh, other uh, virus or whatever. So fortunately, the European Union decided to put a limit in the use of this material and which kind of material can be entered in the food chain. Um, another, can you explain uh, again what type of foodstuff product they are? Well, they are usually um, cereal breakfast, uh, breakfast cereal, sorry, bread, pasta, um, chocolates, uh, different kinds of uh, pralines, biscuits, uh, something like that. So usually is dry material coming from the uh, food industry, brownies, let me say, and so on. So it can be salty or uh, sweet, it depends, and uh, can be mixed and um, uh, in order to produce uh, something completely new, for animals. We have, uh, we got an, uh, several experience of collecting sample here from a different kind of uh, plants in Europe, but usually uh, the um, bakery uh, salty and, uh, and uh, sweet uh, material is the base of, for this kind of material. And this is the reason for which usually they are richest in uh, fat compare the common cereal. And this is, a, is, is also another advantage from a technological point of view, because we have a fortified version of cereal sometimes. And uh, to have full evaluation of sustainability benefit of, so it is important to have, there is somebody who comment about sustainability. We are working on that. We are uh, working on that with some group which are expert in defining and measuring uh, LCA uh, and whatever referred to sustainability. Because of course, now we are able to compare two diets uh, which are similar in terms of nutrient uh, content and so on. And to evaluate uh, in light of the performance of the animals and so on, how much is the, uh, the impact on the environment for each kilogram of uh, uh, meat at the farm gate? We will see, but it's not my field. I have to be honest in this direction. I need help and I'm in conjunction with uh, group which are addressing these topics. As so many, uh, it will be a future standard to include the former food in animal feed. I don't know uh, for sure. For instance, some uh, typical production uh, don't want to add this material in some phases of the growing phase. Other, in other cases, uh, uh, it is appreciated. When we talk about hybrid, which grow, for instance, one kilogram per day, they need a lot of energy. And in, that, in this respect, in my opinion, such kind of material can be extremely useful in defining a perfect diet for such animal, not only for young animals. Um, uh, are microplastics present in former food? Uh, can you eliminate what we, what, for what we have seen, uh, microplastics are present, but in a very small quantity, first of all. Uh, we are working with different approach. Uh, the, near, the, the last one is uh, near infrared spectroscopy combinated with uh, uh, microscopy and so on. Uh, we are in conjunction with the European Reference Laboratory for such kind of approach in order to detect this material. Also with the National Reference Laboratory because there is a lot of interest in order to define the best solution also from this point of view. We will see. Um, can the difficulty Ah, can the difficulty of the transformation process be a limiting factor? Uh, well, I think that uh, to remove the packaging is the big, the main problem. But for what I've seen, for instance, in some plant, they work extremely uh, well. If you remember the picture that I have shown you during the presentation, the bread was extremely clean. 
any moons. Also, the storage site was extremely perfect. We have seen also the cleaning and the sterilization of the container and, and the boxes where this material is uh, stored. And this guarantees that the output of this plant are extremely good. Of course, no, probably not all work in the same way, but I think that there is a lot of pressure also uh, by different organizations, also the FIFA and other organizations around the globe, in order to implement the use of these core byproducts in animal feeding, and therefore also the procedure for ob obtaining the best uh, of this material is, in, is, uh, is growing up very fast. So I think that uh, we have to move to the coffee break. I will, it will be a pleasure for me to answer in uh, the chat when needed uh, to the other question. I thank again everybody to stay with us until now, but I recommend to come back for our invited speaker from US, because uh, uh, really we got the opportunity for us a very big player in the sustainability scenario. So uh, see you soon for the presentation of uh, Greg Toma from uh, Arkansas University. See you soon after the coffee break. So let we move to the next speaker, Professor Greg uh, Toma is the director of research for the University of Arkansas uh, Resiliency Center in Bates, and where he is professor of chemical engineering at the same university. He served as inaugural director for research of the sustainability consortium. He is the North American subject editor for agriculture for the International Journal of Life Cycle Assessment, and he has served as scientific technical organizational committee for several international life cycle assessment conferences. He has been active with the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations Livestock and Environmental Assessment and Performance Partnership. Uh, and since its inception, acting as the technical advisory group lead co lead for development of poultry swine at large ruminant guidelines. And recently served uh, on the steering committee for the Swiss. Uh, um, National Research Foundation research program uh, with the title of Healthy Nutrition and Sustainable Food Production. One of his current sustainability assessment projects is providing uh, evaluation of US food production and consumption. The work is evaluating dry beans and other uh, crop in terms of environmental sustainability and uh, matrix for climate change and other uh, aspects related to sustainability. It's a great pleasure for us to host him. So Greg, the floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction and um, <clears throat> welcome everyone. Uh, I will start sharing my screen. And uh, I assume you can see the screen now. just is coming okay click again okay it's, it's visible okay and you can hear me i just had a message from zoom that zoom yeah yeah crashed. yeah perfectly okay excellent so um Today, I'll give a presentation uh, and first an introduction to uh, sustainability and why we need to measure it, uh, and then a brief overview of life cycle assessment, including the, uh, the so-called flavors of LCA, and then some case studies on uh, animal, uh, animal feeds that, uh, that are um, interesting. <clears throat> so, why sustainability? There are a lot of challenges associated with uh, our food supply globally. Currently, we use about a third of arable cropland for livestock uh, feed. Uh, about 14% of global greenhouse gas emissions uh, can be attributed to livestock production. We have significant nutrient cycling uh, issues and losses uh, of nutrients to the environment, which are, are quite important. We also have uh, significant in the agricultural sector consumption of fresh water. That's today. 
by 2050, we expect uh, another 1.5 to 2 billion people uh, that will need to be feed, uh, resulting in a demand of more food by about 70%. And there is a, also associated with the growing population and increasing middle class in much of the world uh, with increasing demands for animal foods. And so there's this tremendous pressure uh, on the agricultural supply chain for animal sourced feeds and food. I want to talk briefly about <clears throat> natural capital. I've borrowed some of these uh, ideas from the Rocky Mountain Institute. Of course, capitalism is the uh, the principle of using resources and reinvesting them. Uh, and there are several kinds of capital, money, goods, people, and nature. And, and we use all of those. And we need to be thinking about the way in which uh, our resource consumption is, uh, is managed. And so to that end, if we look back historically, uh, the very first uh, industrial revolution in the late 1800s was about increasing productivity because labor was scarce and nature was abundant. And so the, there's a tremendous focus on increasing productivity through machines, uh, factories improved tremendously. Uh, we began uh, seeing improvements in agriculture as well. Today, however, uh, the, the next phase of our evolution in this, in this space is really going to be driven by the recognition, growing recognition that there is an abundance of people. So labor is not uh, typically uh, a problem, but we have to have uh, increased resource productivity. So we need to be cognizant of managing our resources more uh, effectively as we move forward. And this is, this is not just in agriculture, of course, this is across a wide variety of, uh, uh, of production sectors. Going forward, the constraints on uh, our sustainability as a society are not about the, uh, they're not about the infrastructure, they're not about having enough boats, it's about the resources. So we're, we're constrained by the availability of fish, not boats, in the context of uh, thinking about sustainability and food and nutrition security globally. So at the highest level, uh, and this, this um, idea comes from the Brundtland Commission in 1997, that sustainability is really about ensuring the same opportunity to future generations as we have. So we can provide for ourselves today, but we must ensure that the future generations have the same opportunities to provide for themselves as we have had. Given the context of uh, resources becoming limiting, we need to be able to measure uh, what our resource efficiency is. And so without measures and metrics, we risk failure in our sustainability efforts. So we have to be able to document and track our progress. And life cycle assessment provides a, uh, an excellent framework for capturing and interpreting these measures and metrics. And so uh, with that as a background, uh, sustainability requires measurement. What do we what do we do? And so I'll give a brief introduction uh, over the next several slides to the idea of <clears throat> life cycle assessment, which is a uh, really an accounting framework for keeping track of material flows in uh, supply chains. So there's a cartoon on the left. Uh, for, for strawberry yogurt production, showing the, the circularity uh, that Luciano showed in his, uh, talked about briefly in his talk just a few minutes ago. Um, and LCA is guided by a series of international standards published by ISO. Uh, and in the sort of the foundational standard, they talk about uh, four phases of a life cycle assessment. Uh, the goal and scope definition phase. So what is the system that we're interested in studying? Uh, the, the system boundaries, the functional unit, which I'll come back to in a few minutes, as well as allocation. Uh, the most time consuming typically stage of an LCA is, is data collection and understanding the quality of the data 
and and linking it uh, all to a, a background economy uh, with background data for, for example, the production of uh, diesel fuel that's, that's used in farming equipment. Next is the impact assessment. So carbon footprint, water footprint, uh, eutrophication, human health, a wide variety of, uh, of, of characteristics that we are concerned about and we will uh, discuss as we go forward. And ultimately then an interpretation. So what does it mean? How do we, how do we use the information that we've uh, acquired about the system to uh, make it better? Uh, 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 in the upper right here, you see some of the uses for uh, life cycle assessment uh, can be used depending upon the, the stage of the, the product development, can be used in planning uh, the, the design of a product for the end of its life. Uh, you can use it for benchmarking, you can use it for uh, documenting continuous improvement, for example. So it's a multi-step process. The cartoon on the right is a, is a schematic of a system boundary. And we uh, try to evaluate the full supply chain uh, environmental impacts of a product um, or a service. And this is targeted on this idea of a functional unit, which could be, uh, for example, a thousand kilograms of maize at the, at the farm gate, or it could be uh, a cereal that has been uh, processed and, and uh, consumed at a consumer. Uh, and so there are uh, different boundaries that can be adopted uh, for a life cycle assessment. And so we have to be very clear about defining the functional unit, uh, including any particularly important characteristics uh, that, uh, that have to be accounted. Uh, it could be, for example, the dry matter content uh, of, a, of a grain that's being harvested. We also have to define very carefully the system boundaries uh, and shown in the cartoon there, which I'll come back to in just a few minutes. So what are the activities that are included or not included in uh, a particular uh, uh, system that's under study. Now, uh, in almost every system that, that we care about, there will be uh, a, this problem uh, in, in life cycle accounting called multifunctionality. And the, the use of LCA is becoming more and more widespread. And it is quite important that when we are consuming LCAs, right, so reading the literature, it's quite important to understand the distinction between these two types of life cycle assessment, an attributional product system and a consequential product system. For me, the easiest way to, to describe uh, the difference between the two is that an attributional system really comes from uh, viewing the system from an engineering paradigm. The processes are linked physically and sequentially, uh, and we kind of uh, view it as if it were a process flow diagram, for example, and we can connect everything and all of the emissions associated with this uh, you know, network supply chain uh, are divided, right? So the, the division of the pie shown in the cartoon there, uh, and we're looking backwards in time. The consequential product system is really an economic uh, paradigm, and it is uh, based on the idea that markets have an influence. And so when there is uh, uh, multiple products, as a quick example, a dairy, <clears throat> a dairy would produce both milk and meat, right? The cold animals go into the beef sector, the, the milk goes into the dairy sector, the, the, the beef market is therefore influenced by the dairy uh, market, the production of the culled cows. And so understanding the way in which markets uh, respond to the production of these additional products is the characterizing factor of consequential product systems. And so it may not seem that important, the difference. However, I will I'll show uh, again with an example from dairy why this is really important. So we might ask the question, should we intensify dairy production? And if we look at an attributional model in which we have you know, inputs of feed and emissions of enteric methane and manure 
uh, and, and uh, nutrients that uh, are applied to the land. Uh, with these two products, milk and meat, uh, if we take it and we divide it the way we would divide the, the pie in the previous uh, slide, we will see uh, typically about an 80 to 20 split of the uh, said greenhouse gas emissions from the dairy uh, allocated between the meat, the milk and the meat. So 80% of the, the dairy farm emissions would be assigned to the milk. And so under an intensification scenario, if the inputs are held approximately constant and we increase the production of milk with roughly constant uh, inputs, that leads to a lower greenhouse gas intensity for the milk. In an attributional model, intensification is always favored. And so we talk about sustainable intensification quite often, and it's in the context, very frequently in the context of an attributional model where intensification is always uh, beneficial. However, when we take a consequential paradigm and we connect to the markets, we have the same at the dairy, the same inputs and emissions uh, associated with uh, the activity on the dairy, but instead the accounting takes um, the displaced beef, right? So the cold uh, end of life cows displace production from the beef sector. And so this green arrow indicates a credit given to the dairy associated with the displaced market for beef. However, under an intensification scenario, the market for beef doesn't change. And if we increase the production of milk in this scenario, there will still be some displaced beef, but the ratio of displaced beef to milk will be different. It will be smaller. And so this replaced beef that is now no longer provided by the dairy because of the intensification of the dairy itself means that we have to add that burden back in because the beef market will provide that service to society. And it can occur, doesn't always occur, but it can occur that this uh, replaced beef, the red arrow coming in here at the, at the right, can be larger than the benefit that we got from the intensification. And so in a consequential paradigm, there are other potential outcomes from our accounting. Thus, uh, it is quite important to keep in mind what you are reading when you read these, these, this literature. Uh, so we've seen this uh, picture before. Uh, the idea here is just to say that we try to keep a, a track of all of the major inputs and outputs associated with the production uh, and consumption, depending upon the system boundary uh, of the system. The next phase is life cycle impact assessment. So the calculation, if you will, of the carbon footprint, water footprint, et cetera. And the cartoon in the middle uh, takes as its input, the fundamental input, all of the um, emissions uh, coming from the system that we've uh, chosen as a study. And there are midpoint categories uh, listed here, particulate matter, et cetera, uh, damage pathways. So how do those uh, emissions affect uh, ultimately human health, ecosystems, and resource uh, availability. And so the idea is to uh, collapse what can be tens of thousands of, of chemical flows in a system because it's looking at a quite, quite broad system into a manageable number of categories. And so the uh, uh, global warming, of course, is carbon footprint, water footprint, et cetera. <clears throat> There are, I've already mentioned, of course, the International uh, Organization for Standardization, the 14044 standard, but there are also uh, other guidelines and data sets available to help uh, perform life cycle assessments. The, the uh, Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN has published a series of uh, guidance documents. The Product Environmental Footprint uh, guidelines from the European Commission are also quite valuable in uh, defining the ways in which data should be um, collected. 
uh, and then the the uh, <clears throat> excuse me the the global feed lifecycle initiative uh, is a source of data on on feed products that can be used in an LCA. So what can an LCA tell us? Uh, looking at production and consumption of food, this is a chart from a study that we did a few years ago on U.S. dairy production in the United States. It's a box and whisker chart, and it shows on the x-axis the, the fuel and tarot feed and manure, uh, and then the entire farm. The boxes are the 25 and, and 75. The, the whiskers are the 10 and 90 and the individual dots are the outliers above the above or below the 10th or 90th percentiles and showing the carbon footprint. So the main takeaway from this diagram is that uh, among the 540 or so farms that participated in our survey, we see a tremendous variability, almost a factor of five uh, between the best performing in terms of carbon footprint and the worst performing, which means that even without the development of new technologies, without the, you know, even, even without uh, the, the seaweed, for example, there seems to be tremendous opportunity to bring these uh, outlying uh, producers into uh, a, a more um, environmentally friendly area because we know that these other farms at the, at the lower level of carbon footprint are already doing that. So understanding the technology transfer is an important step in the uh, sustainability uh, journey. Uh, just uh, again, real quickly to, to focus on uh, scenario one and two, because these are the scenarios in a dairy looking at changes in uh, uh, feed uh, to the animals and what might be the benefit um, in terms of carbon footprint for those. Uh, this next uh, slide is quite busy, but I'll have you focus on, on just the, the two here. So we had, uh, uh, we can see uh, some, some notable differences between those two scenarios. And so some benefits associated with scenario one compared to scenario two. One other interesting thing about this diagram, the the pie charts with the little uh, orange dot are from uh, a series of Wisconsin farm simulation, and those from New York uh, with the blue dots in the center tend to be lower. So there's some interesting geographic variation uh, that we uh, can also consider. Part of it is driven by weather, uh, but there are a lot of factors that complicate this uh, study of the sustainability of animal uh, feeds and the effect on animals uh, and the food security and uh, nutrition security and sustainability. Another study that we've done looking at um, swine production, across the bottom you see a series of alternate management uh, practices. Um, the two that have the most uh, notable effect here in the center uh, have to do with uh, the use of antibiotics in the case of uh, growth promoting and preventative. Uh, this study was conducted before the U.S. Uh, began the restrictions on antibiotic use in animals uh, that have been common for the for the European Union for quite some time, and so uh, the, these effects are are nonetheless real, right? So there is a a significant uh, increase in the carbon footprint associated with the uh, societal demands to reduce and and have less use of antibiotics. And so understanding trade-offs is a, an important characteristic of, uh, of LCA. Uh, a study that we did, uh, again, a few years ago for swine diets. <clears throat> the, uh, this is a very busy slide, and I'll, and I'll go through it uh, fairly quickly, but there's just a couple of points that are important here. One, this top row uh, looks at the um, four environmental categories of a standard uh, U.S. swine diet, primarily based on corn and soy. Uh, and we have uh, the, the, the sort of standard cost, carbon footprint, water footprint, and land footprint. We looked at the possibility then of reducing crude protein, so replacing soy meal with uh, synthetic amino acids. And we see a slight improvement in uh, cost but we see slight increases in uh, the environmental impact categories 
uh, except for land use, which makes sense because we're replacing soy with a uh, with a synthetic amino acid, so it'd have a, a smaller land footprint. You can see that the, the diets uh, here are shown across the bottom, uh, nursery, grow, and finish uh, in one, two, three, four. And you'll note that the diet itself uh, for each phase is the same across all of these and across all of these. Then when we ask the question, what if we wanted to optimize our uh, ration formulation for uh, cl lower climate change. And we can see that we can reduce the climate change, climate change impact by about 20%, uh, but that the composition of the ration changes dramatically, uh, just shown by the, you know, the pattern that you see here. Uh, likewise, if we optimize for water, we get a completely different uh, feed ration. And of course, all of these are um, formulated with uh, um, the, the nutritional constraints met by all of, the, all of the various rations. The point of this bottom row, of course, is that it is tremendously challenging to manage for cost as well as for other environmental characteristics, for well as, as well as uh, environmental characteristics. So, so there are lots of challenges associated with how we formulate rations uh, going forward. Um, I want to quickly um, touch base on a couple of case studies uh, that the, uh, some colleagues have done. This is from the uh, BASF company. They've uh, developed a uh, uh, software tool called Optenix and looking at uh, some variations in uh, German pork production uh, in, in a couple of cases. So they, they, can't, they changed the uh, nitrogen and phosphorus composition uh, of the rations, and they can see significant reductions in uh, climate impact and in freshwater consumption with this strongly reduced uh, nitrogen phosphorus feed content. So feed formulation matters. Um, in this one, we, we looked at the improvement of feed conversion ratio, and this has, of course, been touched on in the previous two uh, talks. The feed FCR is a, is a tremendously important factor. We see major improvements with uh, even as 15% uh, FCR improvement. I want to touch this slide very briefly because it is another case where the attributional and the consequential paradigms matter. In an attributional modeling paradigm, which is the, uh, the basis for the Optenix software, we see that changing the feed source, right? So if we change from Brazilian soy to US or European soy in the swine ra ration, uh, that we see notable declines in uh, our, our impact categories. This will be true with an attributional model. However, in the consequential paradigm where, where markets are considered, the important point is that changing the source will only have a beneficial effect globally if, the, the, if for example, the Brazilian soy is no longer produced. But the markets globally are such that what will probably happen is that someone else will purchase that. And so while you can make the claim that your footprint has gone down, the, the overall effect on the climate may be much less significant. And so uh, I urge caution in thinking about sustainability through the lens of uh, modifying uh, sources. Another study by a, a group from the Netherlands, Blanc Consultants, looked at broiler production uh, and including um, vitamin D3, eubiotics, phytase, protease, and zolinase. And, and I won't go through the, uh, the list of things here because it's quite, uh, quite extensive, but just to, to show that uh, in this heat map, we can see here column A is the baseline case, so no change. Uh, by removing phytase, we see increases in all of these impact assessment categories, 
Whereas when we include all of the, the solutions, uh, as shown over here, we see some notable improvements in, in greenhouse gas emissions. Again, highlighting the importance of uh, feed formulation in the context of sustainable animal production. We uh, recently completed a study uh, using energy feed corn, which is an uh, has an alpha amylase, heat resistant alpha amylase in it that improves feed conversion ratio. And when we compared uh, a live uh, trial, live feeding trial uh, data from uh, UNL in Nebraska, uh, we see about a 5% decrease across the four impact categories, climate change, land use, water use, and, and fossil energy consumption. And uh, we run uh, Monte Carlo simulations and we, we show that uh, in each row, we have statistically significant uh, differences. And so there are, in addition, right, to things like seaweed, there are uh, some other technologies that uh, may uh, in fact be very beneficial. So I'll uh, conclude with uh, noting that sustainability and measuring uh, that is important if we are going to ensure that future generations will have the same uh, nutrition security that we currently have. Uh, resource use, efficiency, and conservation are very important. Life cycle assessment is uh, an excellent tool for providing the measurement against which we can then manage these very complex systems. We do have good standards and guidelines, and mostly we have uh, sufficient data uh, available to support doing the work that will lead us to uh, make more informed, wiser decisions with regard to food and nutrition security, uh, and in particular, in the context of animal source protein. And so I'll stop with this final slide and entertain any questions that uh, the group may have. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Uh, let me see if there are questions. Yes. Sorry, because they are not stable. They are moving. So, <laughs> so uh, we have to wait. So I have um, in waiting for a question from the floor. Greg, I would like to ask you uh, a comment because uh, we have seen in your presentation that actually, for instance, the use of uh, um, synthetic amino acids has an effect uh, not always positive in terms of uh, in environmental impact. But at the same time, in one of the last uh, slides, you have, have shown that um, putting together different additives, phytase and uh, whatever, uh, it was evaluated positively by the author that I'm going to study the law. So um, it's a little bit confounding for me. So should we put in place all the technology that we have in order to define a very complicated, precise feeding for our animal, and this will give us a positive effect also in terms of environmental sustainability, RCA, or whatever? Yes, yeah, so, so uh, the, the an, an excellent point. The, uh, the study in which we saw an uh, increase in the environmental impact with the synthetic amino acid substitution uh, arose because um, there is, of course, um, soy meal has both protein and, ener and energy. Yeah. When you remove the energy component, the replacement with corn, right, which was the typical replacement uh, in the U.S. diet, more than offset the benefit of reducing the, the soya. And so if you were to reformulate with a different energy carrier, mm -hmm. corn, you could make a benefit in that case. And so it's not, uh, it's not necessarily the case 
what it points out is that it's complicated, okay. yes, and so you have to be very careful about how you uh, how you make the the reformulation of the of the feed uh, with those substitutions. Um, and so, yes, then the, the second part is when we carry on and, and look at this combination of uh, a number of technologies and attitudes. Uh, yes, I think there's tremendous potential for improving the environmental uh, footprint. We, of course, uh, and, and I'm not an animal nutritionist, but I know enough about nutrition to know, of course, that, that you have to be very uh, cognizant that the animal performance is not adversely affected. When, when a colleague in, uh, in swine nutrition here at the University of Arkansas did some studies, where they, uh, I think they replaced back to the seventh limiting amino acid. Uh, mm -hmm. They found that at, at some point the animal performance, even though all of the amino acids and everything were present, that the animal performance began to decline. And so we have to just yeah. be very careful. Well, uh, there is a, a question. Uh, how to measure CFP uh, or climate effect in real at start level? Yeah, that is a very, uh, a very profound question. Um, <clears throat> so the, the framework of life cycle assessment can be applied, uh, of course, at, at any scale, right? From, from a national uh, economy all the way to an individual farm. It's, it's like all models driven by the data that you have available. And so to, to begin looking at the climate effect uh, at farm level, uh, we need to have high quality data at yeah. that farm, right? And so uh, as we see precision agriculture becoming more common, uh, yeah. we'll be able to uh, have, have detailed data about how much uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, et cetera, has been applied on the fields. We'll understand from precision feeding, what the animals are consuming. We already know in the dairy sector, of course, that there are quite um, uh, quite some technologies available with robotic feeding and milking. Um, and then the last thing is, is as we think about carbon sequestration and the role of agriculture in helping to achieve the climate uh, accord from the Paris, the, the Paris Climate Accord, uh, we need uh, the ability to, ability to verify these things. And so I have a colleague at the University of uh, Illinois who is using remote sensing and mathematical modeling to, uh, mm -hmm. to, to study things at field scale. And so I think we're, we're not quite there, but we're, we're on the road to being able to provide guidance at the individual farm level. Oh, okay. um... There is a question about, uh, do you think that silver pasture is a good solution toward a sustainable limestone sector? So again, uh, excellent question. And, and th the answer is yes, um, but we should be uh, aware that there's not a single management system that is no. universally applicable, right? right. So, so we have to understand at local, uh, or regional scale, you know, does does a silver pastoral uh, approach make sense? Um, I, we we know, of course, in Iberia, right? Uh, the the hogs, uh, it's very uh, very much a, a silver pastoral, and it's quite uh, I think quite quite a sustainable uh, production system. And so, um, yes, definitely, but not you know uniformly in every place. Yeah, and. Uh, I don't see any other question, but I have one. In your, in one of your graphs, you have shown that in comparison between New York and Wisconsin, which is the second or first, I never know, which is uh, compared to California, dairy state, Madison, uh, Wisconsin, I mean. Uh, you said uh, there is some differences in terms of uh, uh, geographic uh, distribution of the farmer and so on, which can affect also the output of uh, uh, this such kind of analysis. Uh, well, but of course, as uh, animal nutritionist or as so general public, we need something which is, uh, uh, is the cleaner from this bias or whatever. Um, how uh, this system can be implemented and uh, 
so how we can be really confident about so many papers, so many data that we have in terms of uh, uh, kilogram of uh, carbon dioxide produced or whatever. It's very difficult to find the solution. Uh, it, it is indeed very difficult uh, and it's very confusing and, and uh, different studies may have you know, slightly different assumptions for different things. And so, you know, this kind of comparison is indeed uh, quite challenging. Um, one of the things, so, so there, it, you, you bring up a, a really important point that there are, there are different audiences for uh, these results. And so when, when we talk to producers, right, yeah. it, it's important that we don't, uh, you know, say let's compare Wisconsin and New York because yeah. right, they're they're just different, right? And so we need to frame the conversation, is particularly when we speak with producers. We need to frame the conversation around what can you do to demonstrate your continual improvement, right? So we say, you know, in in Wisconsin, which had a, a slightly higher footprint, and and to be honest, it's not 100% clear how much of it is driven by weather and perhaps soil type and, and these kinds of things, which are just not not under the control of the producer, right? And so, so talking about how do we uh, document the continual improvement for a, for a region is important. That, of course, doesn't address the question of how do we communicate with the consumer. And so in that case, I think that, that the, the community needs to be thinking more uh, in more aggregate terms, right? So we would say, you know, milk from the Northeast or milk from the upper Midwest, rather than trying to differentiate individual, uh, individual farms uh, or, or production regions. And, and we certainly don't um, want to put, you know, make a competition uh, yeah. when, we, when we need everyone to improve, right? But do you think that this such kind of information can be a driving force also for uh, the market in the future? I mean, uh, you mentioned competition between uh, milk from uh, med from uh, Wisconsin compared to. Uh, uh, so the, I think maybe this can be used also for some some stranger campaign of uh, marketing or whatever. And so we have to pay attention about this information because uh, the risk is uh, to get uh, or provide information to the general public, which is not able to distinguish between the model views or whatever, and therefore to create some bias on the market, which is actually not needed, in my opinion. You, you know, you're right, I agree. Um, and, and so this is where, um, you know, industry organizations play an important role to, uh, to, to, act as, you, well, to, to, to act as an aggregator of information okay. so that, so that this, uh, so that, you know, internally, right, we, we, uh, we can understand that there are opportunities that are different between the different locations. And, and I think I see a question from uh, Valentina about different, uh, different approaches generating different impacts. And, and I think that's uh, germane to the, to the conversation here is how do, how do we manage this communication? And, you know, from, from my perspective, right, as a, as a, as a scientist, engineer, uh, my, my goal, I, I, I tell people very often, I'm not, I am not a marketer, right? I, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm a scientist. And so my, my job, I, I think our job as scientists is to, to provide the best information to the people who can make the decisions yeah. to implement the change, right? So this is really my, my role, I, I feel, is much more focused on the producer and not the consumer. Yeah. Um, uh, and so, but, but, but you raise a point that's absolutely valid, right? Somebody has to be thinking about that part as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, so uh, Greg, many thanks. I think the time is uh, really over now. Uh, many thanks for your uh, presentation and also for the discussion. Uh, what we learned, I think, today is that a multidisciplinary approach uh, is needed, especially from this last presentation, uh, who gave us uh, several information, also in terms of uh, who take care of uh, LCA and uh, animal nutrition and what until communication indicating that also soft skills and other skills may be a little bit far from a regular science that we say uh, need to be uh, addressed and combined 
in the network or in the system. So uh, I, I think that uh, the people, for what I can see in the, in the chat, which is moving, so it's very difficult to read for me, sorry, uh, they are happy about this seminar. And uh, I hope uh, really, Greg, to host you in a, in a meeting, maybe in Europe, because I think that you can give a, a very nice uh, view about uh, what is going on in terms of LSTA. We heard from uh, also FIFA, which is the Federation of European Feed Producer, that methodology is a key issue in uh, defining all this aspect of related to environmental uh, impact. So I think that this topic needs to be addressed also in the near future. Thank you very much to everybody for staying with us until the end of this uh, webinar. Thank you again to my speakers. But I think that uh, um, um, Greg, uh, that uh, Gert has a meeting, so he's away. But uh, really, I appreciate a lot and I hope it uh, was the same for the audience. See you soon and uh, keep in touch. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Bye to everybody.